Hi there. So for those of you that were unaware, the 1.30 class actually ended up getting canceled a few minutes into class. I had a sick child I had to go pick up the uh, blessings and burdens of being a parent. But I appreciate you guys, uh, and we've got it figured out. I'm going to go ahead and give this lecture via Camtasia. If at any point in time um, you want to stop or pause the video, all you have to do is hit pause. This is going to be loaded up through YouTube. Everybody should be able to see it. If you can see YouTube, you should be able to see this video. Uh, I think it was a really good idea to get this done so you guys can be sure to not only have this information for the test, but also have it help you on your participations if you haven't completed them yet. So I just wanted to remind you that you do have your unit quiz coming up this week, and um, be sure to study for that because you are going to have content from this very lecture that you are viewing via the Internet. We uh, were talking. We were talking about John Watson. John Watson, formerly known as the devil will forever be known as the devil in my world. If you have hadn't haven't had a chance to check out the YouTube video that we posted online of Watson's experiments, you should really check that out. Uh, it's Little Albert and it's uh, original footage which really kind of speaks to the time and what was happening in his uh, research study. One of the things that I wanted to let you know about John Watson is that uh, he cheated on I don't I don't remember if he had had a wife. Anyway, he slept with his student, his research assistant. The American Psychological Association decided that that was not kosher, and so they removed him from the association. He lost his position at the university that he was at, and then he went on to become the father of modern-day advertising. Yes, the advertising where we place things like Tiger Woods and Buick together uh, in advertising. The idea is that you're going to take something that you have an opinion about, like Tiger Woods, and you're going to pair it with something that you might be neutral, maybe even negative, or just a little slightly positive with. And the idea is that your opinion of Tiger Woods will sort of elevate your opinion of this other or secondary entity. So that's what Watson did in his conditioning research with Little Albert. With Little Albert, he took um, a rat and he placed that rat on little Albert's lap and then proceeded to use a steel beam and banging a steel beam making a really loud horrific noise behind the young boy to scare little Albert. So little Albert initially was not afraid of the rat, showed no fear response whatsoever, was not distressed and then after Watson banged the steel beam while little Albert had the rat on him, little Albert drew the association between the steel beam and the rat and he then started to become really anxious just even around that rat without the steel beam. So that's the reason why I consider Watson to not be a kind person amongst other things. But the information that Watson gave us really helped us understand a lot of stuff. Now Watson wasn't the first person to do conditioning research. That was uh, Ian Pavlov. He was doing research in the area of conditioning with dogs Way, not way before, but long before John Watson, but the information that he had was sort of held under lock and key. He was in an occupied communist territory, so we couldn't actually get that information. After a while, though, uh, when doors started opening and research and intellectual property started to be shared a little bit easier, <coughs> excuse me, with Eastern Europe, um, that information came out. And so now when we think of conditioning, we think of John Watson and we also think of Ian Pavlov. But Watson was one of the first people to put that information out and really start publishing in it. Now this guy is Barrius Foran Frederick, B.F. Skinner. B.F. Skinner, I think of big forehead, it's one of the ways that I remember uh, his initials, I know it's awful. It's a good little acronym, we'll talk about memory and how those things can actually be helpful on our next unit. Skinner really enjoyed um, the idea of what it meant to look at and understand how people moderated their behavior. And he was really interested in not internal processes. He didn't think anything of it. The structuralist, the functionalist, he did not care at all for those internal processes. He was primarily focused on what was observable. What could you see that the person or the entity was doing? And I say entity because he did a lot of animal research. He worked with cats pigeons, um, mice. He did this research because all he cared about was what he could see. It didn't matter what cognitive processes anybody was using or the entity was using. The only thing that mattered was that he was making decisions based upon what he was able to view um, from the subject's behavior, whether that be human or animal. Now Skinner 
um, in rejecting those internal processes, focusing on what's uh, observable. He was interested in looking at the consequences of behavior. We'll talk about the Thorndike effect or the law, the Thorndike's law, where really every behavior has a consequence. And when we see the word consequence, most of us think bad stuff, like, oh, that's a negative thing. And consequence, in this instance, should not be viewed as negative. It is just the result of behavior. You do one thing for somebody, and it might have really awesome consequences. You do the same thing for somebody else, and it might have really negative consequences. So it's important to keep the negativity versus positivity out of the understanding of what the word consequences mean. Remember, this is one of those things you're going to have to kind of unlearn. But he was really focused on behavior, and that's why we call him sort of the father of behaviorism. Now this last guy is one of my favorites. Uh, some of you might have heard of the theory of humanism. It is as of late become more sort of pop psychology as a spiritual perspective or an approach to understanding how we interact and live in the world to become better people in a stronger community. This is Abraham Maslow. And a lot of you might think of uh, a hierarchy of needs. A large triangle had several levels on it. Um, the bottom one being biology and the very top one being self-actualization. Well, that was Abraham Maslow's idea. The tenets of humanism to start off was the primary one was that people were positive. Everybody had good qualities and we needed to focus on that. Abraham Maslow's theory was applied to personality studies, it was applied to clinical programs, it's also now being applied to motivation and even in some ways how we are getting communities and people to sort of refocus and think a little bit more about how we interact with and care for one another. So in addition to the positive qualities of people, humanists also believed that humans have great possibility for growth. So not only were we good people, but we could grow and we could change. And that was one of the cornerstones of his clinical theory when this was used uh, in practice and therapy. <coughs> The last tenet is the freedom to choose one's own destiny. Um, that probably goes parallel with the possibility for growth, but he really believed that no matter where you were, given the right resources and the right frame of mind, you could persevere. And there was very little that locked you into any one destiny, that you really did have uh, the freedom to do that. Now that's the end of our old white dudes lecture. We're going to be moving on to studying sort of the science aspect of psychology. We're going to talk about research studies and even to get into a few statistics. Before we can really get into studies, we have to um, sort of set the framework for what it means to be a scientist or having a good scientific attitude. Having a good scientific attitude means being skeptical but not cynical and open but not gullible. Being skeptical means to question things, to look at things critically and really question whether or not they are reasonable. Cynical is the questioning with an agenda. Cynical is um, sort of debunking or um, negating your approach. So skeptical, when I think of skeptical, I think of questioning with an open mind. And when I think of cynical, I think of questioning with a very closed mind or even uh, a hidden agenda or a very apparent agenda. And open but not gullible fits really well in with the skeptical versus cynical. Open, again, being open to ideas, different perspectives. If I publish a research article and I have one interpretation of my findings, I need to be open to somebody else's interpretation because it might lend itself to a better explanation. So being open but not being gullible. Gullible is when we believe things unquestioningly. Uh, where we believe things without challenging not only the origin of the information, but the content of the information. So all of that little statement works really well. So be skeptical, but not cynical, and open, but not gullible. Now, before we can talk about various kinds of studies or statistics, we need to talk a little bit about the scientific method. This scientific method is used with, within and across all sciences. Um, the first sort of step in our scientific method, or one of the first requirements for a scientific method, is observation and description of a phenomenon or a group of phenomena. 
This is really important because what we're doing in this science is, especially in, in psychology, is we're seeing stuff. You know, it might not be things that are directly observable. It might just be a survey that somebody fills out uh, a thousand miles away from us, but we're still observing a phenomenon or a group of phenomena. If we were to sort of translate this, we might look at this as a chemistry experiment. Um, chemistry experiments require observation and description. How many milliliters of hydrochloride did you put in there? Uh, observation and description are very fundamental to the scientific method. There's a very specific kind of description that we're going to focus on, and that's the operational definition. The operational definition is fundamental in, in most um, studies, especially when we get into psychology studies. We really need to have an objective description of how a research variable is going to be measured and observed. And we need this objective description because what we want to be able to do is we want other people to read our research and we want them to be able to recreate what we saw and what we found and how we interpreted it. Because if we don't find the same thing across groups of people and within different research labs, then maybe our finding might have just been the result of an error in our process. It's sort of uh, validating to have somebody else you know, do our own study and repeat what we've already done, just to sort of check to see if what we're doing is legitimate. And most of the time, if we replicate a research study, we always add an extra something something to it. Um, that way we can see if maybe that extra something something might have uh, contributed to our overall understanding of the phenomenon or the group of phenomena. So the operational definition and objective description of how a research variable is going to be measured and observed. <clears throat> this description must be written with enough detail that it can be replicated by others, and specifically we need to detail our observation and our measurement. One of the things that I wanted to do is I, I want to kind of walk through some examples of measurement and observations. So that way you guys can kind of get an idea of how a researcher might begin to approach developing an operational definition. So here's my first example. This is what we're going to observe. We're going to observe if she is a good mother. I know that's incredibly vague, but we've got to start vague before we can get specific. So we're going to observe if she's a good mother. And one of the things that we have to take into consideration is where are we observing? Under what conditions are we observing this? Would the differences in those conditions, you know, if let's say she was a 23-year-old mom of two versus a 35-year-old mom of two. Like, is there going to be significant differences between that? So not just those uh, within-person differences, which we call demographics, like education, age, race, gender, socioeconomic status, employment, marital status, all of those are demographics, and those influence outcomes. So it's important that we observe those. But this is the phenomena that we're interested in. Is she a good mother? If we observe a mothering behavior within the home, it's going to be very different um, outside of the home and very different in different venues outside. It's going to be very different to observe a mom at a park versus a mom at Costco. And those differences are really important for us to pay attention to because those are going to influence her behavior uh, for many, many reasons. So we're going to observe if she's a good mother. And in this observation, we're going to focus on a few specifics. And one of the things that you would do in developing your operational definition is that you would look at other literature, you would find out how other people measured and observed it, and you would have some good backing or good rationale for why you would observe certain things and what you would measure. But we want to, might want to measure if she was affectionate. We could observe a mom for five minutes and count how many times or get a frequency of how many times the mother is affectionate. It could be um, emotionally affectionate, it could be utilitarian affectionate, where the mom is wiping the mud off the child in a loving manner versus, you know, doing it roughly. We could also count how many times the mother points out a positive feature. Uh, let's say it's at a grocery store. We might count how many times the mother says to her child, thank you so much, Janie, for keeping your hand inside the cart, or thank you so much, Billy, for putting that box of cereal away. We could count those frequencies and, and have that sort of lend to, is she a good mother? We might want to measure if she is patient. Um, good parenting tends to be patient. And we could, in this instance, measure how long she waits. So instead of getting a frequency, we could actually catalog a time. Does she make a request and wait a certain appropriate amount of time? Now, if she makes a request and she waits 
you know, maybe a minute to follow up on the request. That seems to be pretty reasonable. But then on the other side, if we have a mother make a request and then have her not follow up, if the child doesn't make efforts to do it, then that's kind of representative of not so good mothering or good parenting. We might uh, decide to look at whether or not she yells. We might watch 30 seconds of interaction and indicate whether or not the mother yells at the child. And we might decide that it's we're going to base it on decibels, we're going to base it on language. Maybe we could even base it on how frightened the child response, re, child's response is. And in this instance, we might just say, yes, she yelled, or no, she didn't yell within that 30-second 30, 30 increment. So we're, we're observing if she's a good mother, and we're measuring this observation through these different um, observations. Uh, is she helpful? And we might actually script something out, write out some content, describe how she was helpful, maybe some of the outcomes. Um, we could put any number of things. One of the things that we look at doing quite a bit in psychology is we look at taking something that is qualitative, right? We take something that has no numerical value whatsoever and we try to make it numbers. We take something qualitative and we try to make it quantitative. And when we make it quantitative, we can run it through data analysis and get statistics and make predictions and things like that. So it's very interesting the process that some researchers have taken to sort of translate or trans um, modify uh, qualitative information into quantitative. Let's do another example. Uh, sorry for the bad blue. I got it fixed on one slide, but obviously not this one. So we have stress. And again, um, where we observe this would make a difference. And then also um, behaviors uh, that we're going to list out as far as our measurement might change depending on where it's at and what's happening. For example, let's say we are <coughs> excuse me, um, observing stress in college students. Would it make a difference if we were observing stress during the third week of classes, which we are in right now, versus the second to the last week of classes, like dead week right before finals or even finals week? Obviously, the stress experienced during those two different time periods, I mean, intuitively should be different. Um, things are coming to a close. Tests are coming to a head. I mean, environmentally, there are new and different stressors. Now, what we might want to measure in stress, and if you take a second, go ahead and pause this and think about it for yourself. What, what do you think might be some good indicators or good measures of stress? Go ahead and pause if you want to and think. If not, just keep going. Uh, we might look at the environment or the number of stressors they're experiencing. We might look at the number of negative life events. Have they recently broken up with somebody? Have they lost a job? Um, one of the things that I find to be pretty awkward, especially in spring term, is uh, students have to move out of the dorm during finals week. They have a very short, small window of which they have to get their stuff together and get out after their last test. Um, what else is happening that in their life that might be contributing to the stressful experience? The other thing might be the number of examinations. Uh, in this class, you're offered the opportunity to take your final during dead week. That's not offered in the majority of classes, so you've got kind of a heavy testing load in that one week. The number of examinations would make a difference. The thing you sh could also ask yourself is, would the kind of exams make a difference, an essay versus a multiple choice? Maybe you're becoming a teacher and it's a national exam and um, you're based upon national standards. The number of exams, the quality of the exams, uh, the level that you're at. Is this a 101 class or is this a 400 level class? Um, the other thing might also be your major. I mean, if you're in your uh, last semester of your senior year as a psychology major and you've done everything and you've followed the general plan, your last semester, you're going to have lots of deliberal, deliverables, like you have lots of projects to produce and things to create, but you don't have a lot of exams in that last year um, if you set up your coursework right. But if you're pre-med, you're going to end on a test. So those things obviously are going to make a difference in uh, what we're measuring. We might also want to get a self-report. We might just want to step up and ask them. How nervous are you? How are you feeling? And we also might want to ask things like, how are you sleeping? How are you eating? Have you been able to work out? Um, we could also just observe their behavior. We could count the number of fidgets per minute. Um, of course, we'd want to get a baseline or we'd want to get a measure outside of that stressful time period so we can see if there's actually a change. They might just be a fidgety person. 
We could also do some physiological um, assessments. We could look at responses and elevation and stress hormones, respiration. Um, one of the key indicators of physical health is the ability for your heart rate to return to baseline or resting after you get it elevated. And when people are stressed, they have a harder time getting their heart rate back down. So we might even be able to look at that. <clears throat> so here are our operational definitions. We've gone through two examples, both being a good mother and also um, stressful experiences. Now, one of the things that I traditionally do uh, during the semester is we create a, uh, an interactive moment between me and the students. And now, if we were in the lecture hall, this would be exponentially more effective. And I look forward to doing this with you when we uh, get back together this Wednesday. But um, here we go. I'm going to say, uh, for those of you that haven't seen it yet, there's this Geico camel commercial. And uh, the Geico goes whoop whoop or the camel goes whoop whoop like that and um, and at the very end he says hump day so what we're gonna do is I'm gonna give the whoop whoop and you're gonna give the hump day alright so for those of you that are actually watching this and listening to this you'll be in the know it'll be like an inside joke for us on Wednesday because I'm gonna put up one of these and I'm gonna go whoop whoop and you're gonna yell hump day alright I do this because um, a lot of you, while I'm so engaging and very exciting, I realize this. Some of you like to space off. Some of you get busy doing other things if you're on your computer or on your phone or busy doodling in your notebook or talking to your friend. Um, I create this auditory interaction with me in the class. That way it gets everybody's attention so they know that they've got a participation. Sometimes students won't remember the slide with the big red bolded space with the bright yellow words. Um, they might not remember the slide, but most often they remember the auditory. So remember, I'm going to go whoop whoop, and you're going to say hump day. All right, and I'll make sure and post the video. That way you guys understand in context in case you haven't seen it. So your first participation, you're going to get another one assigned um, while you're watching this uh, voiceover PowerPoint. You'll get another one assigned. So if you're making notes right now, just write down two participations. This is our first one. Um, when we're in lecture, you're not going to actually have to write all this down. I'll have all of these information and instructions um, online. There are a few participations where you have to write something down and I'll make sure that you know when that happens. But I want you to recreate what we just did. I want you to take what we just walked through, the process of measurement and description and, I, and observation, and I want you to write something down. Make it up. Make it your own. Observe something you're interested in and think about ways to measure it. Now after we solidify our operational definition, we're going to start looking or at least thinking about theories and oftentimes these theories are going to inform our operational definitions. Uh, a theory is a broad set of closely related ideas that attempt to explain certain observations. And really the majority of our old white dudes, um, the areas in which they were fathers, are kind of like they were the fathers of humanism theory or the fathers of behaviorism theory <laughs> or conditioning theory. Um, these are the people that just sort of created um, or started the umbrella under which a lot of observations happen. For example, I uh, do attachment research, so I follow the attachment theory. Now there are two general kinds of attachment theory. There's the developmental perspective and the social perspective. And I just so happen to be able to cross over both. Uh, my education as a master's degree involved the developmental perspective and then my education and my PhD involved the social perspective. So I've been pretty well versed in that theory from both approaches and which is to say that I use attachment theory to explain a lot of the outcomes and a lot of the behaviors that I see. That's kind of like my lens or my filter that I use when I see interactions and I try to explain them. That's a theory. Now from a theory we're going to want to develop a hypothesis Okay, a hypothesis is an idea that is arrived at logically from a theory um, and a prediction can be tested. So a hypothesis would be, um, we might hypothesize that pre-med students are going to have more stress or experience more stress during finals week than psychology majors. That would be our hypothesis. That's a prediction and that's something we can test. We would measure the stress and all the observations in both groups, both pre-med and both psychology majors, and then we would compare their stress responses. We would compare those things that we measured between the two groups. So we'd make the prediction 
and then we would test that prediction. Testing that prediction comes um, in, our, uh, in our fourth stage, but we got to formulate the hypothesis to explain the phenomenon. And then we use the hypothesis to predict the existence of other phenomenon or predict quantitatively the results of new observations. Okay, the idea is that with the scientific method, we're using these hypotheses born from theories and we're applying them to different circumstances. Now the fourth one is where we actually perform experimental tests. Now experimental tests is kind of a strong word and if I could change the scientific method, I would say the performance of investigations of predictions by several independent experimenters and properly performed experiments. Um, and the reason why I would want to change it to investigations is because we don't always have to do an experiment to test a prediction. And uh, we're going to get into the differences between experiments and correlations and case studies here in um, just a minute. So that's the layout of our scientific method. We observe, we describe, we formulate hypotheses, we use these hypotheses to make predictions, and then we perform uh, investigations on those hypotheses. And in addition, or sort of to cap off or wrap up our scientific method, we want to replicate, which means that we want to conduct these studies more than once on different populations and hopefully get the same results. That way we can say that there's actually something actually exists. And um, a good steward of knowledge will publish and share that information with other people so other people can look at it. And again, you know, being uh, open instead of gullible or being um, critical instead of cynical. Um, now I can't even remember the words. But the idea here is that you want to be open. When you publish information, people are going to give you feedback. When you submit an article, you're going to have peer reviewers review the content of your submission and provide you with possible alternative interpretations. And these in alternative interpretations might be off-putting to some, but then in the end it might actually be really, really helpful in understanding the phenomenon or the phenomena of interest. Now, that was the scientific method. Most of our research studies are involve description and observation. Uh, we could conduct a case study, which is the study of one individual or a small group of individuals. Traditionally, case studies are used in uh, clinical experiments or clinical cases where a therapist might want to try a new approach with a client. They would take detailed notes, not only of the new therapy or the intervention, but then also the client's progress and <laughs> their um, experiences as a participant in this new therapy. Case studies rarely get published. Um, I do believe that there are a couple journals out there that are dedicated to that. It's um, costly for some people to do a case study. It takes quite a bit of time to do one well and we don't get a whole lot of genera uh, generalization out of it. It's hard for us to take a case study and apply the results of one person in one instance in one treatment to a greater percentage of people. And so we kind of try to stay away from uh, just conducting case studies. The other thing we might do, you guys have done this a lot and you will continue to do it for the rest of your life, is a survey. I refer to surveys as being sort of quick and dirty and it's quick and dirty because there's no interaction. Um, I can provide you with this piece of paper and a pen or link you up to a website. You're gonna fill out a survey for um, your third assignment and if you choose research option one, you'll be filling out surveys as well. But this is a, a quick assessment. Uh, we consider it kind of an observation of your experience. Personality measures or surveys, anxiety measures or surveys. Anytime we ask you to indicate your experience or your opinion, that is a survey. And those surveys don't always have to be um, you interacting with inanimate objects. It could actually be a series of questions. That could be a survey. I could be a census taker or a poller and show up at your door and ask you a series of questions about candidates that you're interested in or people that live in your home. Those would also be surveys. Again, they're quick and dirty. We can get a lot of data really, really fast. And the other thing we could do in this description and observation aspect is what we call a naturalistic observation. They used to do these way back in the day where they would go into remote villages in South Africa or Papua New Guinea or South America and they would want to you know, observe these indigenous people um, to see like what was different between our culture and their culture. But when a, when a you know, white man goes into a group of individuals that are not white 
and tries to observe them, that definitely affects their behavior. Uh, one of the areas that we saw sort of an explosion of naturalistic observation was the bullying, at, especially at elementary and junior high schools. Uh, researchers wanted to observe kids behaviors during uh, recess periods or social activities especially outside and if a researcher were to stand out on the grassy field with a white lab coat and a clipboard kids are going to behave differently they're going to be paying more attention they're going to be more sensitive and attentive to their own behavior um, but if you observe them unobtrusively like let's say in a van with a tinted window one-way glass with a camera <laughs> I know it sounds like stalkerish but believe it or not that's that's a very common setup for doing some naturalistic observations um, that way you get to be close and unobtrusive without really influencing the environment by being there naturalistic observations I would say the the, the approach used with the least amount of frequency would be case studies and then naturalistic observations and then um, surveys. Uh, we see, actually I, I guess I might have to reframe that, we see surveys most often and then naturalistic observations and then case studies. I think that's what I said. Um, we see correlations a lot. Now correlations are um, ways in which we try to understand the relationships between two variables or more sometimes and how they change in relation to each other. It's really important that you understand that these two variables are changing in relation to one another, but not because of one another. Okay, that is not what we're getting at when we do a correlation. Uh, for example, studying um, hours spent studying, influ uh, hours spent studying is related to grades. Okay, as your hours spent studying increases, theoretically, we would say that the grades should increase, right? That's kind of a correlation. We can't say that hours spent studying causes an increase in uh, grades. In order for us to get at causes, we really have to do experiments where we're manipulating in the environment and we're controlling lots of variables. Most correlations are just done out in the wild, if you will, um, and not necessarily the wild, but uh, they're done without any manipulation and most often without any interference from a researcher or somebody investigating a phenomenon. Um, one of the fancy correlations I wanted to talk to you about was an illusory correlation. An illusory correlation is a correlation um, that is there but does not seemingly have a, any relationship to one another. The most famous one, of course, is uh, the newspaper article that went something like um, increased risk of drowning with ice cream consumption. It was something like that. And somebody had found or noticed a correlation between ice cream consumption and drowning, that, that as ice cream consumption was increasing, drowning was also increasing. And if you think about that, I mean, like, if we try to figure out how ice cream might influence drowning, we could think maybe intestinal distress or sugar coma or something, but at the end of the day, there's the third variable there. So this, this um, misperception that these variables were varying in relation to each other is actually illusory. It's not really there. Our third variable is weather. As the temperature increases, ice cream consumption increases, and swimming increases. So death by drowning increases. Those are illusory correlations. Those correlations that really don't have any theoretical um, basis. There's no a logical undertone, or there's the third variable. There's the obviously there's this other factor that really is mediating everything. Because then if we look at the relationship between temperature and death by drowning, as the temperature goes up, death by drowning goes up. And if we look at the relationship between uh, weather and ice cream consumption, as ice cream consumption goes up, uh, pardon me, as weather temperatures go up, ice cream consumption goes up. And um, that correlation and that explanation of the relationship between those two variables works. Illusory correlations, two items are totally unrelated. Um, uh, or there's a third variable that's, uh, that's missing there. So this is our first sort of statistic. <coughs> and um, correlations are actually pretty fascinating. We see correlations um, a lot. Now, one of the things you're going to have to unlearn or get over is the idea that positive means good. Now, when I think of positive, I think of good things. I think of adding to a circumstance. Uh, I think of a number line, and it's on the right side of the zero point. 
I think of things that are increasing or good. And in this instance, when we talk about correlation coefficients, we really have to let go of the idea that positive means good. When we see, in this example, when we see that um, this positive sign, now if there's no positive symbol there, that means it's still positive. I mean, it's going to have a negative symbol if it's negative. But if there's nothing there, then it's positive, like you would do with any uh, mathematical computation. If it's positive, that means that both variables are moving in the same direction. So uh, back to our ice cream and weather example. As the temperature increases, ice cream consumption increases. Okay, those two things are moving in the same direction. Now, if I change one of those variables and I say as the temperature increases, what do we, what do we expect to see happen to the frequency of coats on campus? So as things get warmer in the spring, do we expect to see more or fewer coats? We would expect to see fewer coats. Why? Because it's getting hotter. And so as that temperature increases, this other variable is going to be decreasing. That's a negative correlation. So when our variables are moving in opposite directions, okay, one's going up, the other one's going down, it's a negative relationship. When our variables are moving in the same direction, whether they both be up or it, they both be down, that's a positive correlation. So positive means we're sticking together, negative means we're moving independent of each other, okay, or opposite of each other. <coughs> our number right here, this value, this value represents the strength of the relationship. Now, a 0.37, if that was your study and these were your results, you wouldn't get published. You need to have a 0.50 at minimum in order to get published in most journals. So that 0.50 is actually considered a moderate correlation when we talk about strength. All correlations are going to be between 0 and 1. If it's more than 1, then something went wrong in your data. You put something in there wrong. If it's less than 0, if it's a negative, uh, yeah, if it's less than 0, so you could go from, you could also be down to negative 1 if those two variables were moving in opposite directions. So a 0.37 is a very weak correlation. A 0.5 is a moderate correlation. And a 0.7 is a strong correlation. You really need to have a 0.5 in order to get published in, uh, in research. So remember that the symbol, positive or negative, indicates the direction of the relationship. Are those two variables moving together? So it's a positive correlation. Or are they moving in opposite directions, which would be a negative correlation? And then the strength. 5 is moderate. 7 is strong. Anything less than 5 is weak and very, very difficult to publish. Correlation coefficient. Oh, whoop, whoop. What do you say? Do you remember? Okay. Good job. So here's your next participation for today. Um, it's active on our participation page, and it's referred to as correlation. It's a few multiple choice questions. When it comes to these participations, you really should not be spending a lot of time on these, OK? Um, if you're spending 10 minutes, you're spending too much time. All right, or maybe you want to think about the timing of when you're trying these participations. The idea here is to get you outside of the classroom and reinforcing some of the principles that we learned while we were in class, or in this case, while you were viewing this video via YouTube on the internet. Um, yeah, I'll see you on Wednesday. If you're watching this after Wednesday, well, you didn't get to ask me any questions. But um, I'm going to post an announcement on Blackboard. I'm going to send an email out to y'all. I'm going to make sure and get the camel video up so you guys can uh, get some work done. I hope you guys have a great day. Don't forget that these participations are due Tuesday night at midnight, all right? That is uh, absolutely fundamental, Tuesday night by midnight. Thanks again.